Hockey Inside Out, presented to you by the Montreal Gazette. Welcome to the HIO Show. I'm joined this week by regulars Chris Nyland and Jack Todd, and we have a special guest from CBC Daybreak, Andy Bennett. Uh, Chris, the big news this week is obviously Zach Cassian and his car crash. Uh, do you see him playing with the Canadians again? The big news this week, Simon, is I have a jacket on, pal. <laughs> okay, so tune in, check it out, you'll love it. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, Zach Cassian. Um, you know, it's unfortunate what's happening. This kid's ob obviously suffering from an illness. Someone who's had some opportunities to uh, turn his life around before uh, came here, uh, you know, with that baggage. Um, and uh, this is the result. Uh, it's, it's a terrible situation. A lot of people can't understand it uh, or probably sympathize uh, or have sympathy for Zach Cassian because a lot of people don't understand exactly what the illness is all about and uh, this kid um, is certainly one that uh, going into treatment this time and when he gets out he has his work cut out for him. Uh, will he get another chance here in Montreal after he gets out? I don't think that's the important thing. Uh, the most important thing for this kid to do now is worry about his life and get it back on track. Did Mark Bergevin make a big mistake signing him? Michel Therrien said at his press conference on Tuesday that they knew he had been in the program, yeah. substance abuse program. Yeah, well, there's a lot more questions now. When that popped up about this being his second strike, uh, you were like, uh-oh. But I still think it was the right call. I, you know, Prust, everybody says heart and soul of the team. He had four goals last year. It's hard to be the heart and soul of the team. When he was also four breaking goals. down. He's, yeah, his body is way older than he is. Uh, you know, you took a risk because the upside with this kid, if he had his head screwed on great, it, right, is that you have a great power forward who can score, which they've been looking for since John LeClaire, you know? I mean, they said it was a risk, but I, I don't think it's so much a mistake as a, a lack of understanding, really, of what somebody that is in this is going through. I mean, like Chris was saying, there's a, a lot of people don't understand this, and it's not impossible that you have general managers in the National Hockey League, even somebody as, as smart as Mark Bergevin, that maybe didn't quite understand uh, what the situation was, even though he clearly was in stage ones. So that meant that he had, you know, ad admitted that admitted he had, himself admitted himself yeah. for uh, some sort of treatment. But I, I mean, is it a surprise that you uh, kind of fall back into that? That not really, but. I you know, I agree. I think it's so easy to point the finger and just say, oh, you know, these million-dollar hockey players throwing and, and you know, throwing it away. And I just think it's it's too easy to jump to that. And I hope that we start looking at these guys more like people than just commodities. And, you know, he's a 24-year-old young man with a huge upside. This, and this is why I think that the league has right to now. test for this. The league has to test for, co for cocaine. We don't know it was that, but I spent five misspent years living in Manhattan in the 1980s when there was coke at every party and I know the pattern it's a kind of drug that it is the kind of drug that keeps you up until six o'clock in the morning and I, the, the players are so vulnerable to this. They go out, they have a couple beers, every sleazebag in town wants to know exactly. them, wants to get the, next to them. They want a trophy friend. Yeah. They, you know, they, they probably, they, I'm sure they can get the stuff free if they want. And Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the kind of thing, if you have a problem, you have two beers, it makes you so much more susceptible. Yeah, for sure. That, listen, the, the illness is uh, physical and it's mental. Yeah. That uh, obsession and compulsion, once someone takes a drink or does that drug, uh, it just takes you over. And a lot of people, like I said, don't understand that. If Zach Cassian had uh, lymphoma, we'd all be like, oh, the poor kid, geez. But it happens to be an illness that looks as though it's self-induced, you're doing it to yourself, wake up, grow up, Nancy Reagan, just say no to drugs. Okay, get it. It, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, now, Mark Bergman was really upset on Monday. Yeah. I mean, this is before we learned that he'd been put in the substance abuse yeah. program. Did he have right reason to be that angry and should he still be as angry? Uh, I, I, th I think he did because I, I know that they, they knew he had had the stage one. They, I know they had talked to him about it and I wouldn't be surprised if they had Rob Ramage talk to him, you know, as somebody that's been there to some degree. Uh, and I'm sure they were given some guarantees that he's going to live a certain way and he had, he had backslid in the worst possible way. 
at the same time, I think now that Bergevin should have known a little bit more and should maybe be a little bit more sympathetic toward the kid. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, look, he's disappointed. He has a right to be disappointed. They came in, they clearly had a conversation about this being like, look, this is another chance for you. Um, I don't think it's such a bad thing to show and express disappointment in somebody. I think it shows that he cares a, about his players. And this is part of his his family now. And he's allowed to be mad. He's allowed to be upset. Um, but what, what happens next is what it is important. I mean, you you don't wash your hands of somebody, but you can be upset and disappointed in somebody's actions, for sure. You're right. You hit it right in the head with that. And, it, you know, he probably felt let down. Mark, he was a little angry about it. Uh, lack of character, lack of judgment. Well, when somebody who has a problem and they uh, drink or they do drugs, <laughs> it takes that character away and it takes the judgment away. So, yeah, he's right in a lot of ways. Uh, but when you're in that state of mind, probably the state that he was in at the time, you, you just, <laughs> you lose all character, you lose all ability to make good decisions and judgments. Uh, well, go would ahead, you John. be willing to talk to him? After? I'd be more than willing to talk to him. Because um, you're the first person I thought should sit down with him. But. Yeah, I, you know, it's nice because, yes, I'm involved in hockey to some extent in, through my uh, work at TSN, but this kid, to understand what he has to do, um, you get it into intellectually, but the program that he is gonna be in or should be in is one of action, not in, not knowing it intellectually, not uh, just sitting at home. You have to get into action to stay sober on a daily basis. and. Um, he wasn't doing that when he was here. Yeah, we've, got, we've got a lot more to talk about. We'll be right back after a short break, so stick around. Welcome back, everybody. Um, Chris, you've been in Zach Cassian's shoes. You've battled addiction. Uh, if Zach Cassian was sitting in my chair here right now, what would you say to him? I haven't battled it. I'm still battling it every day. And um, yeah, Zach Cassian, if you're sitting next to me right now, I, I just say, listen, uh, yeah. <laughs> In that treatment center, you learned a lot of things. Now it's time to apply those things in your life. Um, get your life together, get your act together, uh, get a good support group around you, keep that support group around you, check in with certain people every day, and um, uh, you know, then and only then should you focus on getting back on the ice and getting around your teammates. You have to prove to yourself and others that you're willing to do the work to stay sober on a daily basis. Right, Jack, the Habs, the puck drops, season opens <laughs> in Toronto <laughs> against the Maple Leafs. Mike Babcock is the savior, the king of Toronto, <laughs> the $8 million coach. Are they gonna good be luck with good? that. <laughs> Are they going to be any good? Well, we're going to find out whether Babcock can coach. To me, honestly, I think he's the most overrated coach in hockey. Not that he's a bad coach, just that, you know, he's held up as a coaching god. The guy's won one Stanley Cup. He won two Olympic gold medals with teams that, that I could have coached. Although he had to handle a lot of egos. Mm -hmm. He had to handle a lot of egos, but, you know, and, and had they not gotten very lucky late in, uh, in Vancouver to tie the game, you know, they, he might not have been in that position. Uh, I think he is a very good coach. Now we're going to find out if he, if he gets this team to 500, I think he's a very good coach. If he gets it to 90 points, I think it's amazing. Would you have benched P.K. Subban? No. I mean, that's no. a big... I would have used him. I mean, that's part of... To me, to me Babcock th thinks in a box. You know, he's not an outside-the-box thinker. Uh, Scotty Worked Bowman... Worked pretty good for Team Canada, though. I know, but Scott, But that's his way, you know. It was a lockdown. They were boring as hell to watch. You, you, <laughs> you know, you, Scotty Bowman could coach any team at any time because he thought. You know, he was a thinker. Babcock is an, is an A-type personality. He's up at 5 a.m. looking at film, but I don't think he's had an original idea in his life. I, I happen to, to know the state of his book when it was first written, and it was did not indicate I'm a genius interested. at work. How do you really feel? I, I, yeah, really, don't way. know that. I, I, look, I, I think I, a comparison think to Scotty Bowman is, is, is you know. impossible. Jack, is that a thumbs down? I, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, you're waffling here. Tell me how you really feel. I mean, I'm excited I to waffle. see what Babcock is going to do. I, I, I just think it's it's yeah. interesting, and I maybe am I'm one of the naive hockey fans who thinks that if you're in the NHL, you're actually a pretty darn good player. So even if the Leafs technically don't have, you know, a super sexy lineup, um, 
Um, if you have yeah. good coaching in there and if he can get this team together and, and get them playing together, I'm interested to see what they can do. Do I think they're going to be winning the Stanley Cup this year? No. But um, do I think they're going to be in the NHL basement? It is going to be Probably interesting because they kept the same bunch of dogs that quit last it year on two a, different coaches. Here's the deal. So if he can get them they going. They will <laughs> compete. Um, they're not going to be a team that we saw last year regardless. Yeah, they lost Kessel, all those goals. But they will compete. They're going to try and be in a lot of close hockey games. They're going to obviously try and keep the score down on the other side, but they're going to have to manufacture some goals, and that's going to be the tough part for them. But um, he, he will demand that those guys work. That's one thing he'll do. And half the battle is getting a group of guys to play together as a team, and he'll do that. What more can you ask for this year? I don't yeah. think much. I, I think they have a better chance of getting the number one pick next year than making the playoffs. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> enough, enough about the Leafs. Let's talk about the Habs a little bit. Jacob De La Rose, 6'3", 214 pounds, sent down to Hamilton, and they claim Paul Byron, 5'7", 153 pounds to take his spot. Is this a mistake? Uh, look at it this way. At least he's not the Byron who swum the, swum the hell of a spot in uh, 1810 and had to club foot. Uh, They'll make Brendan Gallagher look bigger, too. <laughs> and, but you know what? He is wicked fast. Mm -hmm. he, this guy is, is a serious burner. I remember a couple of times seeing him like he, he can put a defense back on its heels just by they got to cope with that speed. Again, though, God, I mean, how many small centermen have we had through here since the whole time that I've been looking at sports in this town, practically, the last big guy I remember who could really play was, was Dom Foose. Mm. That was a hundred centuries ago. I don't know why people always complain about the small centermen. They, I mean, Brian Gianta, pretty good player. Saku Koivu, awesome know. player. I mean, this guy, you know, he's small. Yes, that's that's one of the things. But obviously there was something in Jacob De La Rose that maybe they didn't feel he was ready. Maybe he was a young player that they thought can still develop a little bit more, uh, you know, playing with, in the AHL. Maybe it's a guy that they don't want to ruin if he's not going to be getting the ice time that he needs. And look, speedy, good hands, big heart, apparently, is the other uh, schedule. Yeah report for this kid. I mean, that's those are pretty good. Those are great attributes. But again, look at the last five years, six years, seven years. Who won the Stanley Cup? How many of them had little sentiment? <laughs> um, okay. And uh, listen, I don't want to throw gas in a match on this kid just yet. But he is another small guy. I think it's more a, a depth thing for them. And then who knows? He might end up. Um, over in St. John, you know, yeah. so yeah. again, not play much, I don't think. Uh, between him and Jacob De La Rose, and we say the team, oh, why we go get another small guy? Well, he can play, he's pretty feisty, he can skate, all that, I get it, but this organization now has drafted kids with size, and they're developing those kids now. They're not ready for prime time yet, so Bergevin has moved this team in the right direction as far as look at the size he has drafted, so it's going to take time. Like everybody wanted it to happen right away. And now, in the next couple of years, we're going to see the, the fruits of those drafts that Bergevin had. And we'll see those guys, the McCarrens, the De La Rosa's up here um, on a permanent basis, not up and down. Terry has said he sent De La Rosa down because he's worried about his confidence playing on the fourth line and wanted yeah, to learn yeah, a little yeah. bit more about playing. I think it was football. a good decision. Every decision they had to make, they, they leaned toward the veterans, you know? They kept Fleshman, which I think was a great call. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a veteran team, and, and that's the attitude you have when you know you think you're a contender. For and the you know, Cup. sometimes I feel like we're stuck on this broken record of oh, the Habs are small, the Habs are small. But you're right; they have big guys in the in the system. Like yeah. you, you mentioned, McCarron, big guy, Delarose, big guy. They're guys. They're it's changing and it's yeah. coming. But we're so stuck in this. Fleshman uh, and Simon have some size. I mean, they're not size and teeny. and uh, you know some some stability, which was mentioned as well. It is good yeah. for and this team. No, but and you're right about Fleshman. Fleischman being here, it, it, it's great he's here. No one loves Fleischman more than my man, Sean Gamble. I tell you. <laughs> the day Fleischman got here, he said, that's my boy. He's going to be on the team. You wait and sure enough, like uh, Campbell knows great, what's going great, on. Good camp, yeah. Yeah. That's it for another week of the HIO show. Enjoy the hockey. We're back to the regular stuff, regular season starting in Toronto. See you next week.